All right, episode seven here with Leo Walsh. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm honored. Yeah, I'm I'm pumped. Uh, we first got in touch. It was probably like four years ago now, right? Yeah, I don't even know. I forget how I first heard your name, but like I remember hearing about like this guy who's just like starting a cool company locally and like does clothing. And I was and I was trying to do the bike trip, and I was like, oh, I'm like I don't know what I'm doing. Like I I wanted to like maybe sell merch or something like that. Yeah. And I don't know how we ended up connecting, but uh, we graciously like you graciously got on a phone call with me, and I was like, I don't really know what I want to do. But like, and you <laughs> were like, yeah, man, just ideas. like let me know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a. Uh, it was such a cool thing, and that's like we we never met in person before, besides like quickly at the gym the other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. But um, I was like right off the bat. So you drove your bicycle across America. Well, yeah. what <laughs> what spawned that idea? Like, what drove you to do that? Um, so I, I guess the long story is like I I was living in New York, New York City. I went to school in New York, went to Fordham, graduated in 2014, and then I was living in New York for less, the few years after that. Mm-hmm. And I was just kind of like, like, I love New York. I still love New York and I miss it sometimes. But like, I was very much like, I need to do something. Like Mm -hmm. I need to, I'm going to stay here forever if I don't like leave. Just felt like claustrophobic a little bit. And it's weird because like New York is so big. You wouldn't think that's claustrophobic. But like when you're in your little, I don't know, that you have your own world within this Mm -hmm. big place. And if you stay in that, it's like, all right, I guess I'm here. But I I just like, I don't know. And and around that time, I was like, my wheels were turning of like, what, what am I actually going to do? Mm-hmm. And I heard of a guy who was biking or who had biked from Oregon to Patagonia. And I was like, that's possible. Like people do that. And then like, that's what got like the wheel turning. I was like, okay, like I need to do that before I'm like 30 or something like that. Yeah. And there was always like reasons why I wasn't going to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. Like family stuff or like weddings that I couldn't miss. Right. And then like COVID hit. And there were no excuses. It was like nothing going on. Best friend's wedding canceled, postponed. Like who knows when that's going to happen. It's like, okay, Leo, if you're going to do this, like just like now is the time. Yeah. So good silver lining for COVID, I guess. Yeah. 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 That was the only intent, like just to like break free kind of, and just like go see it. Like it's like everybody always kind of talks about, at least myself and my friends, like we're like, we should have done a cross country trip, even in a car or whatever, like right out of college, like everybody's in a rush to get work in or this or that. And it's like, you don't realize those are like the most opportune times to do stuff like that because you don't have any like financial obligations yet. And then it's like, yeah, to like have the cojones to just go do it after being out of school and working for a few years. Like that's, that's wild, man. Yeah, but like, and like you hear, like when you're that age, when you're in your 20s, like old people will, t- not old people, but like people will tell you like, hey, like enjoy these times, like make the most of it because like when you're 30 or 40 and you have kids, you're not gonna be able to do it. And you're like, okay, yeah, cool. I'll get this cool stuff eventually. Yeah. But then like, I don't know, it's like there's certain like moments where you're like, okay, like this is it. Like no more excuses now. Yeah. You can like do it now or you'll probably never do it. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I'm lucky that like, because like if, if, not like if COVID never happened, like I, I might not have ever done it. Right. Know? Yeah. And that's a, that had to be like a life changing experience, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, like the best, but also like worst thing that I've ever done. Yeah. Like some days were just like the hard, like you're just like, why am I doing this? I know. I wanted to ask you about that. Like how tough was it just on your body? Like not, not only the mental side, but just the physical side. Like how yeah. many miles were you like roughly doing a day? <laughs> well, so I didn't even bike. Like I fell in love with biking in new york i would i would commute to work every day Mm -hmm. um it was like do you know do you know jody mead i feel like we're gonna we're gonna drop some like yeah yeah uh so he he had like a he's fulton fish market is like a e-commerce uh he a company he started um so i was working for him biking to a fish market uh from astoria to the bronx every day it's Mm -hmm. like eight eight miles each day Hmm. but it was like it was like a fish market so it's like 2 a.m right i was biking to work so you could really cook yeah so (laughs) and that's when i like fell in love with biking so that's when i like i thought i thought i was like a decent cyclist but Mm -hmm. like i had never ridden like before day one of the bike trip i had never ridden more than i think like 20 miles maybe right for whatever reason i was like yeah i think 75 miles on day one is a good call (laughs) so so i biked from like my parents home in clark summit to bloomsburg pennsylvania day one and I, and it was pouring rain. Oh, like the second I pet, like my first pedal was just like buckets. Oh man. Um, 
I went immediately down. like second guessing your yeah, decision. Like, but there's also like a piece of me that was like, yes, like I like if you're gonna do this, you're gonna have to put up with this stuff. So like day one, why? Yeah, not? true. You set uh, the, set the bar yeah. low, I guess, <laughs> yeah. early, and uh, uh, the rest is smooth sailing, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, 75 miles day one, but then and then like my entire body was like killing me. Yeah. Um, but that was I only did that because like I had there's like a an app or like a website called warm showers which is like couch surfing for cyclists mm-hmm. so i like reached out to a guy in bloomsburg like thinking like okay i can make it there but at the time like mile 40 i was like what am i doing i'm yeah. not gonna make it to bloomsburg <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna have to text jared be like hey i can't make it tonight but i <laughs> but i made it and then like by the eventually i like figured out like okay like don't plan too far ahead like just like wake up figure out like how, how far you can go that day and like then like figure out the the sleeping situation as the day goes yeah is that what you use for the most part like that app or whatever to try and find sleeping arrangements or were you yeah. like bopping around like obviously i saw like so you were you did a really nice job of like documenting it and it was so interesting to see where like if you were passing through a town or a city where you knew somebody lived like you get yeah. to maybe crash with them or they yeah, wash yeah. your clothes or whatever but like for the most part are you just couch surfing yeah and i had like a tent so and it was mid-covid so it was like even if i'm reaching out to people I would never be like, Hey, can I stay in your house? I'd be like, do you have like, yeah, it was, it was an, it was an odd time, you know? Uh, and so I would just like reach out and be like, Hey, do you have like a spot in your yard where I can pitch a tent? And some people would be like, Oh, you have an extra bedroom, like come on in and that'd be awesome. But for the most part, I'll just like reach out about like asking for a a tent space or I would just like wild camp somewhere in like a state park or something. That's wild, man. Yeah. Dude, that's so cool. Like, and like how much preparation I guess I like went into. So I know you said like the most you ever did was like 20 miles in a day or whatever. And like, I guess aside from the, the physical side of it, just like prepping gear, pre- like making sure you have the right bike to, to hold yeah. up to, to all this, like how much, uh, like how'd that all go? There's a lot of YouTube searching, like best bike, bike pack. Like I watch like every bike packing video that has ever been made. Mm-hmm. Um, and but like, at the, and then ultimately I would just like, I kind of like had like a duffel bag. I just like kind of, it was like kind of like a makeshift mm-hmm. bike packing setup that I had. Um, like, I don't think anyone puts like a full duffel bag on there, but maybe, I don't know. But like, I feel like, like most people have like paneers or whatever they're called, mm-hmm. like on the front and back. And then like, a, um, so I had like a bit of a makeshift, uh, bike setup, but, and my bike was a track checkpoint 2019, maybe I got it from Cedar bike. Oh really? I got it like knowing like thinking like all right i'm gonna do this bike trip yeah. but like not really told i didn't really tell anyone i was just like yeah i got a bike but like in the back of my head i was like this is a bike so nobody country. knew you were doing this trip really um until like a few months like maybe like two or three months beforehand i told my family they, yeah. i think they knew that i was like tossing around like some sort of idea in my head but uh when i told my parents they were like not like <laughs> you're you're crazy they truly <laughs> like my family truly thought i was going to die and like <laughs> and i was like selfishly i didn't like consider the effect that it would have on my family before I did it. It was like, I'm, I'm the only one who's going to be biking. Like I'm going to be pitching the tent. I'm going to be like passing roadkill. Yeah. You're the one roughing it. I'm doing it. You mentally need this right now. Whatever. I need to do this. But like telling your mother that you're going to do this. Yeah. Like you just can't, I didn't appreciate or understand like a mother's love for their son and their son being like, Hey, I'm going to go like throw myself into danger for like three months and you're just going to have to deal with it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, like, but like stay, stay, stay on post and I'll uh, give you an update every once in a while whenever I can. And I don't know about you. Like, are you good with keeping in touch with your parents? The worst, <laughs> like the worst. I, I do much better with like keeping in touch, like stopping by mm-hmm. than I am. Like if I'm out doing something, like if I'm gone on a trip for two weeks, I mean, next to nothing. Yeah. And, but it takes like intention. It yes. takes like, okay, I'm being a bad son right now. Yeah. Reach out to your, <laughs> yeah. And like, I don't know. It, it's so like, I, knowing that in myself, I, I, I need, and I did, I wasn't good about keeping in touch with my parents, but I was like, I tried to be intentional about like, hey, right. found a spot to sleep. But I'm bed. sure if you talk to my mom, she'd be like, yeah, he, he could reach yeah, out like a little more. Once a week wasn't enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what time are you waking up every day? Like, are you trying to get, get up and at it early like so okay so number one what time of the year did you start um this was august uh, early august of 2020 that's a good time to start but you definitely probably hit some hot ass days yeah but, but yeah yeah uh some days quick one quick favor to ask of you guys there's one really simple way that you could help support this podcast this was my goal for 2024 to put out a podcast every week 
And so far, the feedback has been really, really positive. People really seem to be enjoying the conversations that we've been having. But what I notice is 89% of the people that are watching on YouTube and listening on Spotify aren't subscribed or aren't following. So if you could just do me that one solid and go ahead and click subscribe on YouTube or follow on Spotify, it would support the podcast more than I could probably articulate. I promise this will be the only thing I ever ask of you guys and it's only gonna help make this show get better. I'm constantly trying to increase the production value, get better guests on, you know, just keep leveling this thing up. So thank you in advance. I appreciate it so much. On to the show. Like Virginia in, in August? I didn't realize how mountainous and long Mm -hmm. because I went from like the northeast of Virginia to the southwest of Virginia. And that's like the, it's just like a long state and it's all so mountainous. Right. And I didn't, I didn't realize it. And there's like some hot and very high elevation days of like climbing. Mm -hmm. It was just like, there's there's no preparation for that other than just like doing it. Right. You just got to bite down and kind (laughs) of grit your way through it. Yeah. Um, but then by the time you get out west and in the mount, like the Colorado mountains in like October, or like late September, then it's like freezing at night. Yeah, big time, up. big yeah. swings, like, like from early in the day until yeah. like seven at night. It's and like, I was thinking like you, you've done like, because you, at the first episode you're talking to um, Jake. Jake, yeah. I also, Jake, I don't like, he might not, I don't know if he would remember me, but we, like when he was a senior in high school, he went to Spain for like a... You know, like high schools do just like trips in the, yeah. the summer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with like teachers or whatever. So my best friend growing up, his, his mom was a Spanish teacher. So she like chaperoned a trip to Spain. Oh, really? And so I t- chaperoned with my friend Roland and uh, Jake and like all of his friends were like the seniors in high school. Oh, really? Who, like, went to Spain. <laughs> That's awesome. And I remember like... He has to remember you were there. Like, he, he has But to. Like, I, like I haven't seen him since. Like we just like literally went to Spain for like 10 days and then yeah. like haven't seen him since. But oh, so no like shit. seeing you like... Seeing that first uh, episode was awesome. I was like, "Oh, Jake!" Like he, because I remember like he was just like such a good dude. Like, yeah. I knew I knew him for like ten days, but like just like seeing him interact with his peers, it was like he's just like a natural, like good person and like a like like leadership qualities. Yeah, for just, sure. Like, emanate from him for sure. Uh, just like a cool dude. I've always um, got that that uh vibe. Like even when I was like getting to know Jake um early on, because like um where my parents lived right across the street this my buddy dylan um lived across the street but he was quite a few years younger and he was buddies with jake and that's kind of how i linked up with those guys because they're a few years younger than me um and like right off the bat like jake was always like mature for his age had his shit together yeah yeah like those leadership qualities and stuff like you said he's just yeah he's a good dude but your conversation with him about hunting and like the outdoorsiness of that Mm -hmm. got like piqued my interest because like you know the bike trip but you had to do all these like you know wake up in a tent and like freezing cold yeah. and like that's like all the hunting is you're just like chilling out in the cold waiting for like yeah a deer to come pretty much for the <laughs> most part um yeah around here the hunting is quite a bit different than it is out there like out west it's more spot and stock just given the nature of the landscape mm-hmm. where like here like you're obviously familiar like Pennsylvania hunters like you're sitting in a tree stand most of the time just waiting and obviously there's a lot of scouting and and strategy that goes into setting yourself up for success yeah um but ultimately when push comes to shove you are just sitting and waiting um we're out there it's much more active um when like you're you're really trekking some putting some miles in every day and hauling a good amount of gear and everything so it's it's a lot different in that regard but yeah in terms of roughing it man like the shit you did is tenfold compared to what i was even doing it was only like 10 days like you three months you said yeah it was like yeah i think it was like 75 days god damn yeah but it's like if you could do the hunting it's just like the mindset of like all right i'm just gonna do this for 70 yeah, 75 it just days. becomes normal now it's yeah like you're just gonna like exercise a lot yeah camp a lot <laughs> yeah. and then you're in california did you lose a shit ton of weight and stuff yeah i and I didn't realize it until like a few weeks in. Um, I just like wasn't eating enough because I didn't realize like how much I was like burning off. Right. Um, and I stepped on a scale in someone's like ra- some random person's house, and I was like, "Oh God, I I need to eat." <laughs> <laughs> I'm down like ten pounds. Yeah. I'm like you're lean guy to start. Yeah, no. So, uh, but that was like, and then that became like one of the best parts is like there is zero guilt around food. Right. I would just like kill my body for seventy miles yeah. and then just 
house food. It's just fuel then. It's, it's the best feeling. Yeah, it's not <laughs> it's not mouth pleasure anymore. It is fuel yeah. and you earned every damn bite that yes. you're getting. It was so good. So like that juicy cheeseburger or whatever. Yeah, like so many kid. donuts. Yeah. <laughs> so many donuts. I love that donuts. That sugar now. rush. <laughs> um, how, how, I guess, how did the eating go? Like there's so many questions I have about this trip. Like obviously, like you had to be packing like some sort of like bar, like because you don't want to stop. I was, uh, like once you're in a groove and you're getting into like maybe some more like remote roads yeah. and stuff where like you don't know when your next meal might come. Yeah. Like how would you plan all that out? There were some yeah there were some squirrely days. Um, it's it took it took like failures of like oh god I didn't prepare well enough yeah. on this day. Um, to be like, okay, you need to like plan out your food and water rations mm-hmm. uh, a few days in advance. Um, I had like a little like camping stove thing. Yeah. Um, but, I would, but I'm not like a good cook. So like, what are they like a jet boy or whatever those things? Yeah. Are? Like a li- it has like a little like gas canister and then like a, so you could just like heat up water essentially. Mm-hmm. And so I would do like ramen or like REI has some cool, like yeah. just like easy to make stuff. Yeah. Um, like pork dinners, like f- freeze dried or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, so that stuff like carry me, but also just like makeshift meals from Dollar General. Dollar General is like was like a godsend. Saving they have, grace through yeah, the whole thing. They have everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can make a peanut butter and jelly out of that for yeah. sure. <laughs> and and like, but like you can't get like bread because the bread will smush. So you oh, just right. get like um like tortillas, like corn tortillas. Yeah, peanut butter and jelly on corn tortilla. <laughs> like it sounds like that. But like when you're on a bike and you just biked like forty miles in the heat and you're just like, oh, this is needs so something. Good. Yeah, like yeah. dude, yeah, like again like this is this pales in comparison to what you're doing but like even when like we were in uh either glacier or or the tetons like you go on a like a long hike like a nine ten mile hike and tons of elevation game yeah or gain like anything at the end just tastes so much better so i can't imagine like putting in the miles you're putting in it's just like eating anything at that point you truly you don't the level of appreciation you have for that meal is off the Richter scale compared to just like an average meal. <laughs> yeah. But, and like we, we get so, uh, used to just like being able to just like get food at a snap, like mm-hmm. whenever you want that, like, but we, we can get that, that feeling of like, Oh, I would just like, I'm, I've been camping for like, I don't know. It's the, the luxuries of, of being able to get anywhere whenever we want and mm-hmm. to get food from any, anywhere whenever we want. I think we just like lose track of like, it's good to have those feelings of like, oh my God, this like very basic meal yes. is so good. Agreed. <laughs> Dude, I think that that is so lost and yeah. that's where like putting yourself into those uncomfortable situations mm-hmm. where um, like it's true, you're, you're just like in essence like taking a step back like 300 years or like maybe more, whatever, yeah. whatever the, the, the amount of years is where it's just like this is like the level of gratification you could get just out of life from that one meal because your level of appreciation is so different is um it's just something that like not a lot of people experience unfortunately and like you don't have to experience it often like if you did it twice a year or like just go on a grueling hike or just Mm -hmm. go on a crazy long bike ride where like you're just winging it like like you did and like you don't have to do it for 75 days like just do it for two or three yeah like go on a back backpacking trip with your buddies over uh, and like the meals taste better. The beer tastes better. Like everything is just so much better. And it's like, damn, life could be like that. It's just not. <laughs> I feel like you and your friends, from what I've gathered, again, we just met today officially, like personally, but I feel like from what I've seen from you, like you and your buddies, like do that really well. Like you guys just like get together and hang out. Yeah. And, like your bachelor party. Like, yeah, it's, um, it's something I definitely take for granted at times and I'm appreciating more like in the last like two or three years just because like you're starting to look around and realize how rare it is. Yeah. I, I truly don't know how it happened. Like we had like a, such a core group of friends, like say, I don't know, 15 of us from like high school and then yeah. like, you know, some some in, some out, like through the college years and everything like that. And then like post, post-grad, post like everybody, like some people stay in the city, some people, yeah. whatever, but a lot of people have gravitated back here. And... um we picked like right back up and like I said, like some in, some out, but for the most part, like we still have like 10 guys, like at any given weekend, we could just be like, Hey, what's going on guys? Like, and at least five of them are around to hang out. And like, yeah, we, that is one thing I I will uh, pat the boys on the back for. We do a good job of getting together and now it's just normal. It's just like built in and like all of our like girlfriends or fiance's wives at this point, 
are like integrated in in like naturally in a natural way and it, it worked out like we do i was talking to john tabone from bar Paza. like yeah. we do first friends friday somebody different every friday or every first friday gets to pick the restaurant we all go to and like there's a group of probably like 10 to 14 of us that go every and like just little shit like that it's so nice like i i'm trying not to ever take that stuff for granted yeah and do you is there anything like um organized within like the locals only like name that you do or is that just like you just take pictures of those things and that becomes like a branding type of thing so a lot of it is like, hey, we're doing this anyway. I might as well like make a little bit of a yeah, photo yeah. shoot out of it. And sometimes it is intentional because obviously stuff gets busy, especially in the summer and stuff like that when you're trying to get some of this stuff out. But it's like, hey, boys, like let's just have a day and I'll bring my camera. I'll, I'll see if Amber's around, like if she's interested in coming up. And uh, she always helps out. And it's just like, yeah, it's kind of just documenting like our bullshit weekends that we do anyway. So um that that is something that i've talked about in the past like when i started the brand i'm like like calling it locals only project i think like there's this like weird connotation that goes with just the word local where it's like you start to like associate it with um it's just like a not fun brand mm. or, or not brand's not the right word but like it's just not a fun word it's just like a like um like a chamber of commerce type word, like yeah. not to throw them under the bus, but it's just like, almost. yes, bureaucratic yeah. is a great word. And it's just like, yeah, like supporting local, like everybody could get behind that. It's, it's an obvious answer yeah. to a lot of things. Um, but I wanted to, to build the brand around kind of the life I was living. So it didn't take a ton of effort. And it's like locals only project could mean so many different things. It, it could mean like stopping in at the, um, local like hardware store instead of going to home depot but it could also just mean like fostering those relationships with your buddies that you're lucky enough to to be around still so like you try and hit it from those different angles and um it just makes it easier like to 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 have content to post to the internet and like build the brand awareness around and then like lead right into like the roundup event that i do every summer um It just, I'm like, that's what I want to do. Like to have a big ass party every summer with a bunch of like-minded people. Like it's the best. It's like one of my favorite days of the year. It's like a (laughs) like mini wedding without any ceremony. It's the best. And uh, I think a lot of people enjoy it too. So yeah, just kind of positioning the brand in that regard um, was something I was conscious of very early just because like I didn't want to fall into the trap of some of the other ways you could go with just the word local. How did you, how did you come to the decision of like making this brand though? Like, was it like a slow burn of like, okay, like what, this is like a clothing brand. This is like more of like a philosophy around like my, my values. Or was it like, was it like a, oh, like a light bulb moment. I need to do this. Um, or somewhere in between. Somewhere in between, honestly. Um, I always had this like creative itch on the side of my brain work because like I was working in finance and like I'm not gonna lie like people start businesses to make money like I it was money motivated to an mm-hmm. extent like yeah. I was looking for a second source of income um I had just bought my house and I'm like oh shit like bills are real now <laughs> and uh yeah like I had student loans like I'm like all right I gotta figure something out so it was a combination of like having that creative itch that I wanted to scratch trying to make a little bit more money for myself, but also putting a mission behind the whole thing where it's like you could start a clothing brand and sure, if people like your designs and this and that, like you could do well, but I I at least wanted to have a mission behind it and a purpose. Um, And it's something like I truly believed in, like just hearing the stories like growing up about, obviously everybody talks about like the good old days, but like, mm-hmm. where it's just like, we used to have all these local shops and everybody would pop in there. Like after the high school football game or basketball game, like everybody was there hanging out. It was a great hang for everybody. And, and like, you just kind of see the trend of how things were going and, um, people are just becoming more isolated with the way they go about their lives. So I was like, you know what? Like I, I might not have a physical like brick and mortar store just yet or anything, but at least I could build a brand that could potentially bring people together and at least like get that ethos out there of like hey we need to support these places before they're gone and we're run by like a corporate environment completely um it's just like what makes like i'm sure on your travels like it's what 
that's what makes towns interesting. Like those little restaurants and those little boutique shops and, and like you pop in here, you pop in there. It's like, yeah, you could go through any town and find a, a Chipotle or a, a Home Depot. But like when you pop into the hardware store where the guy had it for the last 40 years and like he, you have a cool conversation with him or like just simple stuff like that um, is kind of where my mind was when creating the whole thing. So yeah, to answer your question, a combination of of the three things you mentioned um, and it could kind of just snowballed from there. Like it's kind of always um, evolving to an extent. Like I never envisioned doing a podcast yeah. and then I just became a podcast consumer and I'm like, this is awesome. And, and it plays right into like just having these conversations with interesting people and highlighting business owners and stuff like that in the area and local legends like yourself. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, dude, I'm just winging it. Like, <laughs> For the most part, like there's there's a fifty percent intentionality and then fifty percent like yeah, we'll see what happens next year. We're all just winging it. Yeah, like n- no one actually knows what we're doing. Yeah, we're all just making it up. But yeah, like, very much figuring that out. Like yeah. you hear that? Oh, what did I, like one time, it's like the older you get, you just realize like your parents were just as clueless yeah. as, as you are right now, yeah. and just figuring things out on the fly. And it's just when you're younger, you're like you look up to them, like you know they got everything regimented. Like they, it's like they know what they're doing and everybody's figuring it out on the fly. Everyone's figuring it out. And I, I forget that often that like I need to have all the answers, but like there's so many, I don't know. It's just like, even just like a few years ago, I, I thought one thing and then now you're like, Oh God, I, how did I think that? I know. And you meet, you meet someone who like has a different opinion. You're like, Oh wow. And that's like the best part. I think like what I, I love about your brand and what, like what I found on the bike trip was just like so much of, of, any experience is just like the people that you come across Mm -hmm. and like for you to like even just like your the pictures and like your branding is just like yes there's products there but like it's mostly it's just like having like you had like you said like having a good time with with friends and then like good pictures might come from that wearing like cool like that hat is awesome i I saw that i was like yeah i gotta get you one (laughs) i i I was uh i was actually thinking that i'm like i gotta get leo one of these hats when i put it on today but i gotta i gotta like get more local only stuff because like get the, you geared up the stuff no i gotta i gotta purchase though because nah. like, i i feel like i don't know i there's a part of me that like wants to buy less stuff and mm-hmm. like buy like but if i'm gonna buy stuff it needs to be from like people like cool people that i like and like make cool stuff yeah. like yourself a local legend like yourself <laughs> or like use stuff that because like i don't know like i i don't there's a there's a piece of me that just like wants to like buy everything that I like. I struggle with like, okay, live simply. And mm-hmm. like so much of like the bike trip and that philosophy was like simple living. And like, I identify with that, but then I like see like a really cool bike and I'm like, God, I need that brand new bike. Yeah. It's like a few thousand dollars. Could make my afford. life better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, really this one's just fine. Yeah. Uh, dude, I, I'm the same exact way. Like so much of the stuff I'm buying anymore. Like I'm, I'm just like trying to buy the most timeless stuff. I'm like, I know my style now yeah. or I know like what I'm going to use it for. I like a very utilitarian approach where I'm like, I know I'm going to wear this for the next 20 years and I don't give a shit what anybody thinks about yeah. it. Yeah. Like I like this and I know I'm going to like it cause I've been wearing it for the last like five years. Yep. So screw it. Like I'm just buying less like trendy shit. Yeah. Um, this shirt has a hole. In it. Sorry, microphone. This shirt has a hole in it. I don't, and I just love character. it. Yeah, I can't I can't not wear it. Yeah, it's a good nice shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I think that's what I was gonna ask you actually. Like, I guess what was some of your like biggest takeaways from your bike trip? Just because like in that same vein where like you're talking about living simply and like you'd realize um you have some realizations when you do stuff like that. And it's mm-hmm. like I could live more simply and, and like I get so much satisfaction out of XYZ part of this trip. Um, like what were some of your biggest takeaways yeah it was definitely the people it was just like people would just go out of their way to like the amount of people who just like came up asked me what i was doing because I, w- I had like i had like a basketball on my bike i'd be like in random places that like a person with a bike shouldn't like a circumvented great sand dunes national park and i had to really? walk my bike like 10 miles <laughs> through sand oh God. and but i would just like it would just be like like families just like out like camping and then just like some guy with a basketball on his like there's no basketball court hundreds of miles right and i'm walking a bike with all my belongings through sand like 10 miles <laughs> dude i would pay to like hear those people's conversations yeah. like what the hell is this guy doing but like 
and people would like when you see someone like that like someone is bound to just be like hey man what are you doing <laughs> so then i just like tell them they'd be like can i give you like money or like drink and i'm like that's so like that's so kind like people would just like stop and like offer me a banana really or like that's awesome someone just give me ten dollars in a gas station i'm just like thank you B- yeah. butch like yeah. he's like yeah I, I would ask people their names and then i think it was but no i forget his name he's like i'm mike but my friends call me bug or something like that i was like god i love hey, you. bug <laughs> whatever dude it, it is so true and, and like you hear uh I feel like I you hear um, musicians or artists talk about it more so just because like they're traveling the country, obviously more so than most people, mm-hmm. and you hear them on podcasts now and everything. And like the common denom- denominator, a lot of them say is like there's way more good people out there than bad. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, when you're famous, you get a different interaction than the average bear, but um, I think that is true. Like yeah. m- more people are a lot nicer and considerate than the news will have you believe. Yeah, because like the like, we see so much. Like the thing that gets our attention is when people do the worst thing that they've ever done in their yeah. entire lives, and then we're like, "Man, people mm-hmm. suck. People are the worst." Yeah. But like ninety five percent of the time, like even like on the bike trip, I'd be biking through, like, like once I crossed the Mason Dixon line, literally like within like a few miles, I saw my first Confederate flag, and I was like, "Man, this is crazy." Like, mm-hmm. if I I don't know what would happen if I looked if i had like darker skin right like i I truly don't know yeah but like at the same time like i probably talked to a bunch of people who didn't have any like thing in common with me maybe politically or like i don't know like very little in common with our backgrounds and whatever but like they were good people and they were like they like wanted to help me right and like i think coming to it's hard to like reckon with that. It's like, okay, like in a different environment, this person might be a complete asshole, Mm -hmm. but like to me, they were very kind and like very gracious and welcoming. So like, I don't know. It's hard to like, I don't know. People are complex. Yeah. uh, Yeah. But like, I think like the more we're exposed to that, it's like, okay, like all we can do is like hope, like when we meet someone, hope that we get their good side or like hope that we can like bring out their good side Mm -hmm. because like there is a bad side. We all have a bad side. Yeah. And like, yeah, for sure. We can. Yeah. Set and setting. You could, a lot of people are are capable of things that you know you're not used to or would never expect from people but that's that's where i think so much of america not to like go political here at all yeah, cuz no, like i i, 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 I have political. no i have no business talking about it but like the news and the two party system just yeah. truly drives a wedge between us that otherwise wouldn't exist like you're yeah. saying like if if it wasn't so polarizing in what we're consuming we wouldn't see it as polarizing or mm-hmm. or interpret it that way. Yeah. But they position it that way because it, it's just just the way the country is run now, unfortunately. But like, if we were just having these daily interactions with anybody, left, right, whatever, for the most part, it would probably be a good interaction. But mm-hmm. then like, there's certain hot topics or, or um, hot spots for people where like, yeah, they're gonna fly off the handle because they feel so strongly about it because the last twenty years they've been consuming. You know, like this is you and then that's them. Yeah. But like really we're all the same. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like not to go on that spiel, but um, no, I fully agree. Like the, the yeah. I like dipping your toes into the politics talk is like it it can get me like, man, like why is it why don't we just like chill out a bit? Yeah. <laughs> like, I know. I truly believe like the two part system, it is silly. Like why because like I just asked you a question, I was like, well, is it this or this? And it was like it's probably something in the middle. But right. like for politically, like the most important decision that we're making, there's no middle ground. And if right. it's a middle ground, it's like, what are you doing? Right. Yeah, the middle ground gets no traction. And yeah. like, um, it's if you asked, I truly believe if you ask seventy five percent of America, most people I would say would be somewhere in the middle yeah. on most things. But like for whatever reason we're still rolling this like two party system that like I said is just drives a wedge between us and it's I don't know I think it's broken I think people are trying to fix it but it's just that that cream doesn't rise to the top always because the there's stops in place to uh, limit those people from reaching that level of platform unfortunately but yeah yeah it is what it is I mean should we start a political podcast <laughs> dude I wouldn't make it a half hour people <laughs> would like this kid's an idiot he doesn't know anything <laughs> shut him up are you are, is starting a podcast is is any of you like oh god like i'm recording absolutely everything that comes out of my mouth like who knows what's gonna like luckily i'm editing too but oh, no no yeah, no. You're good. no i i 
I am editing all these episodes, but I am doing my damnedest to not cut anything out. The only thing I'm cutting out is like if there's a big gap or like yeah. like one of us has like a huge brain fart and it's just like 10 seconds of dead yeah, air yeah. thinking. Yeah. That's the only thing I'm cutting. Yeah. Um, Because I, I want it to be as authentic and real as possible. But yeah, um, yeah the pod, it, it is, it's concerning because of all the uh, AI that's popping up where it's like, if you have five podcasts out there, that's probably enough language for that model to interpret oh, yeah. you and get you to say anything. Like there's, they have enough to work with now where otherwise I'm like, there's maybe like three little blurbs for me yeah. out there somewhere. And like, probably couldn't make a, a pointed story out of what I have on the internet. But now it's like, they could probably get me to say whatever they want me to say. Yeah, what are we going to do about that? I'm worried about videos. Yeah. It's just like, you're not going to know what to believe. And like, if the powers that be, especially early stages, like when, like I, I feel like, like our parents' age, where like, if they see it on the internet, it's still real. Um like they're going to see videos and be like, holy shit, that's going on in Mississippi right now. Yeah. And like everyone's going to believe it. It looks so real. We were just, I, I just did a, another podcast this week with Mike Elward and we were talking about it. We're like, um, I don't know if you saw, they, there was like four examples that like chat GPT spinoff um, did. And it was just like a litter of golden retriever puppies playing in the snow. Um, and then like a cinematic um like astronaut in the desert dude it looked like a hollywood film really like you would have no idea unless you're really really nitpicking it it looked perfect and it was completely only generated from the prompt no post editing and it's terrifying that is terrifying yeah i'm nervous about it <laughs> just because like how, like do you watermark it like somehow that like yeah this is real like is there like metadata that they could attach to videos to show like no, this is actually um, a real video versus computer generated. I don't know. I, I guess we're going to have to work through that. But I think AI is going faster than we're ready for. Yeah, I don't even know. Like, there's, I feel like there's just like too much of, mm -hmm. it, of all of it to like actually understand it. Yeah, that's that's the other problem. We're not exposed until it's too late. Like, yeah, the people in charge of the companies are distributing that however way they're going to make the most bang for their buck and then it's like well it's out there now can't yeah. put the toothpaste back in the tube i feel like a lot of that was probably the same with like the internet like mm -hmm. we didn't know what like you see like the clips from like the 90s of like bill gates talking about this like internet thing yeah and everyone's like what what are yeah. you talking about i'm not i don't need one in my house yeah it's for astronauts <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like it's it's all encompassing yeah for our society today now like, we all have one in our pocket and like yeah. can't live without it yeah it's insane yeah yeah, it's just, it's weird to think um, just how far things have developed, like from our age, like when we were kids and um, to now. It's like, well, that's going to happen again. We're going to be 60 and we're going to be like, holy shit. Like yeah. things were nice back in the 2020 a yeah. age, like yeah. besides COVID. But <laughs> yeah, COVID. Um, talking about simpler things though. Um, so when you did your bike ride, one of the driving forces behind it i think i don't want to put words in your mouth but like what's the tie in there with peach baskets which is yeah. a brand of yours that you started um so you played basketball in high school and everything and then you played at fordham you walked on at fordham yeah and uh so obviously it's a love of yours i'm sure mm -hmm. and then i saw like you started this account called peach baskets and um the whole concept of it is just different basketball hoops from all over the country in like obscure cool rundown whatever places um and like there's some really really neat photography coming in i'm sure a lot of it is directly from you and then i think people were even sending in um cool pictures as well right yeah yeah um the the pictures so like the start of it was um at fordham i had a journalism class i studied like communications i didn't really know what i wanted to do yeah uh but I studied communications in English and there was a journalism, a journalism class that was like, write a first person story. And it was just like very open-ended. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why, but I chose to just like write a first person story about the basketball hoop that was just like in my driveway my whole life. Cause mm -hmm. like, that's where I like fell in love with the game and like played it with my brother and all my siblings and my, my dad. Um, and it just like invoked so much nostalgia in me. And then I like wrote the paper and I was pretty proud of it, of just like the story that it told. 
and I was like, oh, like there's probably something there, like a like everyone kind of has their own like hoop mm-hmm. maybe, um, and there's like an artistic project maybe down the road somewhere. Like I kind of like stored that, um, and then that was like 2013 maybe, um, and then I was living out of my car in 2018 ish, 2019. Um, and I did like a circle around the U S and Canada for like three months, just like living out, of, living out of my car. And like, that's when I like got my, I like got a used camera and I just was like, Oh, like maybe I could just like start taking pictures of hoops that I come across. Mm-hmm. And, and then I started the Instagram. So I just like take the pictures, like was learning photography and like Lightroom along the way. Um, was like working out of like, I was working for Jody Mead, uh, mm-hmm. out of just like Starbucks and then like driving around the country throughout. Um, and I started sharing them on Instagram and people like kind of liked them. And it was like, and that like kind of solidified my thought that like, yeah, like there is just like, no matter what, no matter what you see, like if it's like an old battered hoop, there's like a story there that yeah. it's like someone put up a hoop because they thought that it might be useful right here. Mm-hmm. And like, that's like, I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and like, as like years and decades and like storms and like it got hit by a car, like someone backed into it and yeah. like, it is all these like bumps and bruises and then all of a sudden it's just like right there and it's like that's the frame like that's the picture right there and it te- like you don't need much else you just like throw that up there right maybe edit and you could infer a bit. so much from yeah like set and setting again of like where that hoop is like if there's vines growing up over mm-hmm. it and it's it's on an old garage or if it's in the middle of the desert and it's like the standalone silhouette of a basketball hoop yeah and like nothing else to be seen around it like there's so many um dude i was obsessed like with the concept like right off the bat i'm like this is the coolest thing ever because like there is a certain level of nostalgia with it Mm -hmm. and um yeah just it is true art because it could be interpreted so many different ways Mm -hmm. by so many different people Mm -hmm. that's where i think it's so cool sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there but no yeah no i just wanted to chime in you got it you you nailed it that's exactly what i'm like yeah what i'm going for And and it was so much like growing up I don't know if you played basketball growing up or like, I think you said you play again. I listened to your podcast. So yeah. I you play pickup on like Mondays. Or yeah, something. we play. Um, yeah, I played growing up. Um, like whatever, nothing yeah. special, but like loved it growing up. Yeah. It's like obsessed. Like, yeah. Yeah. And especially around here. Yeah. Like basketball is kind of like the sport. Yes. Um, and so, and so much of my identity was wrapped up in basketball mm-hmm. and like, just like playing and like the sport and like the NBA and like the professional of it, like all the, but then, like there's this other side, like like you said, like the artistic side, and like so much of the sport itself is very artistic. Like if you take the ball out, and it's just like you just like watch these people. Oh, it's like yeah. a ballet. It's yeah. like beautiful. Yeah. But watching Kyrie. Yeah, it's truly like poetry in motion. A, he is a magician. Mm-hmm. It's, I love watching him play basketball. Mm-hmm. But like, there's, there's an artistic aspect of basketball that I didn't appreciate growing up until like. I had to stop playing and then it was still a part of my identity and I was like, okay, like where is that identity? Like if I'm not like an NBA player, but I still love basketball, how is that going to like manifest as I get older and whatever? So that's when like the artisticness and like the photography kind of all coalesced into peach baskets. And uh, it's been, it's been really fun. I haven't really done much uh, in the last few years just cause like I've live in Philly now and I've uh, working full time, but um, I'm starting to try to, I'm getting that like creative itch again to yeah. try to like, yeah document more and share more i think you really got something there man like it's i think that truly could go as far as you take it (laughs) i i genuinely believe that like i wouldn't say that about a lot of things to a lot of people like it's such a common thread for so many people and it's such a cool concept i think like it's it's outstanding yeah thank you thank you yeah i appreciate that and there's all like i'm not the first like there's a bunch of cool people doing it also um like shooting hoops on instagram um rob hammer on instagram there's a lot of like cool people doing like the same thing but that's the cool part about it's like none of the hoops that i've come across is probably one that any of anyone else has ever come across right. so like we're all just like kind of telling our own story through pictures and um yeah it's 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 fun i think that's one of the cool things about it too so like how how it weaved in like one of your passions in a completely different way is so interesting and, and evident right off the bat like you don't start something like that unless you have your your type of background probably but the cool part to me is how it could kind of develop into something that like you're not doing that in a silo like that could become such a community thing Mm -hmm. where like like i said like people are sending in or tagging peach baskets Mm -hmm. and like dude i've thought about so many times like when i'm doing local deliveries around here Mm -hmm. so like if people are within like 
five ten miles and i'm and there's like three orders in clark summit or pittston like sometimes i'll take a drive on like a tuesday night rather than actually shipping it like usps or whatever yeah and i'll like pull into somebody's driveway like go throw their package up on their porch and i turn around and across the street there's like the peach basket hoop where it's just like this like uh like fenced in little area like i said like there might be some greenery growing over it it's like not not been used for like 10 or 15 years and I truly like I, I have taken multiple times taken pictures and I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to send that to Leo or whatever. And I, I never do. But I'm like that it like it could get to the point where like anytime somebody sees a cool basketball hoop, like they immediately think of peach baskets. And like to me, that's so cool because then you could have um, like a basketball charity event mm-hmm. called Peach. Like there's so many different ways you could go with it and make it a community rather than just like an artistic expression of, yeah. of what you're um, kind of trying to scratch. So that's, what's cool to me, but yeah, um, yeah you gotta, that. you gotta fire that thing up. <laughs> I know. And the, the cool part about it is that like, I don't feel like, I agree. I, I think there's like something, um, but I don't feel like, like in a rush to like do it. I'm mm-hmm. just kind of like trying to like let it, Cause I have a bunch of pictures, like yeah, like we were I talking bet. about. <laughs> we were talking about like very poorly organized pictures in Lightroom. Of yeah. Just like, oh right, I took that picture in like Montana. I forgot about that. Um, and like someday when I have the time, I'll probably just like sit down and like make it organized, and so then I can have like more of a concept of of like what could be shared. And then like yeah, from that, any you know, who knows what what could come of that like community wise. But um, yeah, it's, it's been neat. yeah, it's been it's been cool. And like yeah, it's cool to have like people like actually like coming across things in their community that they wouldn't normally see and like take a picture and then like Mm -hmm. send it in it's fun yeah i think um kind of finding the i don't want to say like the romantic side in the in the nothings but Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying basically it's like otherwise you just kind of pass by um and not notice it but something like your account where like sparks that little interest and like Next thing you know, that person takes a picture of that and like they're getting into photography and they might yeah. branch out and do something completely different. But like, it's cool how you could be like an inspiration and um, to, to certain people. Oh, dude, it just, I just remembered. Did you, cause like we're the same age and I, I don't think you would have ever heard of it cause like it wasn't that big of a deal, but it was on the news. Um, we were probably in like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, something around that. Um, do you know where Cafe Soriano is in Peckville? It's like a little I've breakfast and lunch place, but it's right on Main Street in Peckville. Well, behind it, there's an alley and there's a, a garage and there was just like a standalone hoop um, tacked onto the top of the garage. And don't ask me how or why anybody ever noticed, but if you were standing at like a 10 degree angle to it, like so like pretty much parallel to it, you were able to see, somebody saw a vision of the Virgin Mary on the backboard at night if like that. because there was like a reflector from a guardrail across the street giving just enough light onto the backboard i love that and <laughs> dude like people were coming from all over to look at it it was like a spiritual spiritual awakening oh, in peckville man. everybody's just standing in the alley like trying to find the angle in the, and like you really could see it did you go yeah oh yeah oh, and like everybody saw it it was Dang. crazy but it's like how the hell is that there and um that would have been a good hoop. That I would have been still there. Yeah, I was just gonna ask: Is it? Might have to take a drive it, down. Was it like, what makes it the the? Is it like the way the light hits it? Or yeah, it, okay. and you could just see like the perfect silhouette. I, I can't really remember exactly what made, but like clear as day. Man, I, Virgin yeah. Mary. I might need to get the coordinates of that one. I hope it's still there. That's the yeah I, yeah. So there's a, there's a PNC Bank right there. It's PNC Bank in Peckville. It's right behind that. So if okay. you're ever down there, yeah. um, I hope the hoop is still there. Yeah, I um, might have to go right after. Dude, this. like ever like for like three nights that you couldn't find a place to park. <laughs> Everybody was down there just trying to get Peckville a glimpse. PA, everyone's yeah, everyone's coming in, flying in from yeah. Italy to see the the Mecca. Area. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it was wild. <laughs> um, sorry, brief pause there. Had to fire up a camera. Um. So we're talking camera gear. So I have the Canon R5, which has like been my workhorse for the last probably four years or so now. Love it. Like it's just so good at everything, photo and video. And then I picked up two more cameras for the podcast, um, two Sonys, because I had some Sony glass from my camera um, previous to that. Um, but then I have the uh, Fujifilm X100V which is like, it got really popular on the internet, like around the time I was getting it. 
and uh it's the like most fun camera just because it's mindless so it's a more so you could set it up as like a point and shoot Mm -hmm. and um but you could put these like film simulations in it so it like kind of comes out of camera looking like film as close as you could get and you could there's like all these different recipes that you could get on the internet so you could like tweak out like the color and the clarity and and the um green and uh, all this stuff um so you could get some really cool looking um pictures right out of camera with that because as i'm sure you know like sometimes you take all these pictures and then you import them to lightroom like we we're talking about and then they just sit there because you don't feel like editing them yeah that's exactly why i got that camera because it's i just shoot jpegs with it and i just what however it comes out of camera i just use it and it's it's neat look and it's like uh talking about before how um i actually was thinking about this how you were saying like with the brand like how we just kind of create the environment and like take pictures and they come out cool mm-hmm. like don't you feel like um like polaroids from like the 90s yeah. or um like point and shoots and stuff um like those pictures just have so much more character to them that versus like today's pictures that we're getting yeah but i don't know if it's because of like the cameras themselves i think it's just like the times because like cds are coming back into style right i think it's just like give it like 20 30 years like the picture like the the pictures that you're taking on these might be cool yeah and right invoke the same nostalgia in like 2060 yeah that's Um, a good point but i think that's just like the like that's what art does is like it will always like evolve and then like circle back yeah like yeah. i i just my, my sister does like videography and, and photography too and i just got her like this cool I, I walk into a camera store again like i don't need to be spending money but i do i walk <laughs> into a camera store and i'm like looking for like like maybe i forgot what i was looking for maybe just like a battery or like a new sd card and i saw this cool like it looks like a camcorder mm-hmm. and i talked to the guy he was like yeah, is that, this is actually like a film camera and i was like all right, I need to get it. it it's so cool. That's so I got awesome. it for my sister. Um, I don't even know how good the cam, like the picture quality that actually yeah. is, but I'm sure like it's going to invoke like 90s nostalgia because it was made in the 90s. And it's like, oh yeah. Like, yeah. That's I, I think the utility of some of those tools is what invoked, or not invoked, but created for better pictures and video too, where like the point and shoot system versus like having to dial everything in mm-hmm. with, with some of the cameras today, it, takes that split second or or not it takes like maybe two full seconds to get it looking perfect so you get the perfect image but the moment's kind of gone yeah yeah, where like if it's a point and shoot and like you're at a party and you just like you and your uh fiance are sitting there and it's like hey smile like you don't have time to like fix your hair it's just like boom quick done and that's why the pictures are better Yeah, yeah to your point like it's not the camera but it's creating the environment for a better quality story yeah and so, that's why that's why we love like film like yeah. film cameras there's like a, a a grain and like a there's a nostalgia i think like it's almost like a lot of the peach baskets art is just like tapping into that nostalgia which is almost like a cheat code into like mm-hmm. good like like compelling art is just like nostalgia yeah but like that's kind of it it's like we all just like we all just like love what we used to be living. Like mm-hmm. my brother sent me a thing. I'm not on TikTok, but he sends me like stuff like TikTok adjacent, like reels and stuff. And there's one that he sent me recently of just like, it's just like probably taken on a nineties camera, but it was, or I think it was like early 2000. It was like, it's just like films of like a backyard in the spring mm-hmm. and it's just like a swing swinging. But there's like the birds of like a late August that are in the background. And it's just like different. It's like an op- above ground pool. And it's just like di- different scenes. And it's like, it's 2005 you just came home from your friend's house or you, you're going to your friend's house tonight to like watch a movie. Yeah. Uh, it's Friday night. And you're just like, yes, I'm here. Like I'm in that moment right now. It's 2005. Like the bird, that bird is chirping because I know that it's like late August and like I'm almost at Lake Ariel with my cousins. It's like, yeah, it's, it's wild how, how much stuff like that just like phew, takes yeah. you right back. Like certain smells, smells. Like yeah. if you like it, it's it's gross but like a locker room smell like there if you just got like a whiff yeah if you just got like a whiff of like a certain thing it's like boom i'm back in the locker room it's high school and like we just got done it's like it's it's wild how like and like yeah that i think that's like some of the coolest part i think and i think if you get into photography you have to have some 
level of capacity for or like a love for nostalgia because Mm -hmm. you're already it's like future nostalgia like you're planning ahead it's like Mm -hmm. i want to have these memories yeah because maybe nobody else is around around me is is capturing them like somebody should at least that's how i feel yeah and i'm sure everybody gets into it for different reasons um but like i know like almost like anytime i'm taking pictures or videos it's like i know this is going to be awesome in like 10 years yeah and like you're doing it for future you to be proud of your past you of like, mm-hmm. cause like I'll, I'll look back at like some of, cause I was like, I would like write to my, like a journal for the bike trip. Um, and I'll look back at my writing now, like four or whatever years later. And I'm like, man, I'm so happy. I like, I'm so proud of past Leo to have done this. Yeah. Cause like, if I didn't write that down in that moment of like, I just, you know, biked, I don't know how long. And like, I almost like I threw up behind a dumpster because I <laughs> ate too much sugar at Waffle House. Like, <laughs> That being in that moment and being able to document that is like invaluable. Yeah. Uh, and like a picture, I'm sure like if you read any, like any of those journals from any given day, you just remember so much more from the day yeah. too. It's just yeah. like all it takes is a picture. All it takes is a sentence of like throwing up behind the, the dumpster. And then you remember 75% more of that yeah. day where otherwise like it might just get mixed in with everything else. Like life goes on and brain can only hold so many memories. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about. How many were you? Uh, were you taking a lot of pictures of hoops on your on your ride, like it, through your stops, or kind of just like as they popped up? Yeah, know? it was definitely as they popped up. I had like a like a a fake system because like if I stopped and took a picture of every single basketball yeah. like cross, I just wouldn't You'd make never it. get there. Yeah, <laughs> so it was like almost like a split second thing. Like if I saw a hoop and my fingers like touched the brakes that was like, okay, I need to go shoot that. But if I saw it and it, like, it didn't feel right and it didn't like break immediately, yeah. it was just like, all right, that's not worth it. You need that kind of system. Yeah. If yeah. it's not, if it's not a, uh, what's the phrase? If it's not a fuck yes, it's a no. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Which I is, gotta, I gotta show the camera to this guy. Oh yeah. That camera there will show it. Hopefully it grabs it. Home is where them fuckers ain't. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I hope my mom doesn't watch this. I got that. Um, probably peak COVID actually did you yeah because it was like yeah I'm like it's fitting now it's like the, it hits the perfect like quilting of like this is a nice little like yeah like a grandma's uh yeah. hand stitched quilt or whatever I love it that's my favorite mug um so more about your not to drag out the uh bike story but it is super interesting to me and I feel like we only got to Virginia so like what was your <laughs> what was your path you don't have to go like state by state but like generally like where'd you go Oh, no, you said south of Mason-Dixon. Sorry, we got past Virginia. Yeah, so I went, but I, I took an odd route. Like, there's different, like, cross-country bike routes mm-hmm. that I was, like, that was, like, part of the preparations. Like, how am I actually going to get there? Like, are there, like, is there a safe way to get there? Uh, and there is, there's, like, a transatlantic bike route that goes, like, I think more north and ends in, like, the northwest. But mm-hmm. I wanted to go, I don't know why I wanted to go south to D. I think that was, like, the closest, like, kind of, like, coast, maybe. Mm-hmm. I went south to DC first and stayed with my friend Colin. Shout out Colin Tanzitz um, and and uh, and Steve Hayen in DC. And then from there I went like just like due west essentially um, through like Virginia, Kentucky, and then like through just like Middle America, just like was farmlands. It, was and that stuff. rough? Like was that the roughest stretch, Middle America? Like the flyover states? Not really. That was like kind of like I I was by then I was like in bike shape. I had like figured out true. like the routine of it all mm-hmm. and i was just kind of like coasting it, and it felt good and it wasn't hilly like right. virginia <laughs> like the shenandoah mountains that was killer and yeah, then the colorado and like and the desert the california desert that was actually probably the worst yeah um, i was gonna ask where'd you finally land like what was the final spot the final spot was venice beach like the basketball courts of venice beach oh yeah yeah nice um yeah and my sisters and friends and cousins were there to like and uh we were raising money for uh peace players and like some of the people who worked for peace players were there and they just like kind of like made like a ceremony or like a, a celebration of it which was cool oh that's um, awesome yeah yeah it's like the uh, longest marathon ever um, <laughs> that's dude that is so wild like like how gas were you at the end were, were you just like so happy to be over or was it like at that point like you you are in bike shape and it was just another day because like at some point, like your body does get accustomed to it, I'm sure. But at the same time, like 75 days is a long time to be yeah, I putting was, that many miles. How many total miles? Do you know? I, it's all on Strava. Um, do you, are you on Strava? Uh-uh. I love Strava these days. Um, I wasn't. 
I don't even know what it is. It's like a it's like a social media for exercise. You like log your exercises. Oh, really? Um, and like you could like compete if you want with your friends yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Just like, yeah. It's more of like a I, I see it as more of like a doc like there's definitely like competitions. There's like like I like you would I would start at the start of the of the ride each day and then end it at the end and like mm-hmm. Once you finish, it gives you like trophies. Like you were the second fastest for this stretch. So oh, it's no like, shit. yeah, it's it's cool. It's um, cool. I got to check it out. Yeah, I would like that. Um, and people like log their like you know work like weight workouts too. You yeah. can do all that. Um, hmm. but so like I think it was. I didn't. I never actually tallied up all the miles, but probably or maybe I did three thousand something. Maybe has to be right. Like yeah, somewhere around because like yeah. But yeah, I didn't know like how much. Um, you know, if if it, you didn't take the most direct route, like how many additional miles? But either way, three thousand yeah. miles is insane. Yeah, yeah, it was. But by the time I was so ready to be done, I yeah. was just like, I need home, I need my family, I yeah. need like a bed in the sink. So you started in August and finished in October, October, mid October. Damn, yeah. it's a good time to come home. Yeah, fall time at yeah. home it hits different. Nostalgia, baby. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, it's uh, at least for me, anyway. Especially around here. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the yeah. experience the the actual fall season stuff. Um, that's cool. Is that like your proudest accomplishment to date? Uh, yeah, it's definitely. You know, I'm sure you've had. I mean, I'm sure that locals only is like a thing that you like. It's fun to have something that you want to do. And then you do it and it's in your rear view mirror and you like learn from it mm-hmm. more so like I'm four years removed from the bike trip and I'm like learning stuff about myself through that mm-hmm. all all the time. Um, but like the, the same goes for like when I did the, when I lived on my car um, and like started the peach baskets project, like I'm proud of that too. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm proud of, I think like the, what like started this trajectory for me, not trajectory, but like this, like. I don't know if it's a mindset or whatever, but like making the basketball team at Fordham, like a, that was like so much of my identity was basketball. And then like all of a sudden you hit college and it's like, Hey, you're not good enough to play. Like for, right. for whatever reason Ripped in high school. From, yeah. yeah. When I, did you play like football in high school? Mm-hmm. Did you like, did you, were you good? Like, did you want to play in college? Did you play in college? No, I didn't play in college. I, no, I couldn't have played in college. Like, so everybody gives me slack. I was a tight end, but I was also the punter. And oh. so like everybody's like, Oh, you were the punter, whatever. I That's awesome. If I pushed it, I maybe could have punted in college, but I'm like, Oh wow. It's not worth it. Like to go punt at a D three school, I'm like, eh, whatever, just hang it up. Did you play soccer too? Early like up until I started playing football. So that's kinda of where I got the yeah. yeah the I don't think I've ever too. met a punter tight end. That's awesome. Yeah. I love well, that combo. Small schools. I guess you gotta yeah. <laughs> you gotta have some uh people doing both, but but like there was like for me there was a part of me that was just like yeah like I'm gonna play in high school and then I'm gonna play in college and I'm probably gonna play in the NBA <laughs> yeah. but like I didn't like actually put the work I'm in. doing it yeah <laughs> I didn't actually like put the work in to do it but yeah. then like so then like college like high school end of high school came and I was like oh no one's really no one really wants me to play college play college basketball like mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't put the work in to do it I just like assumed that like I'd play college basketball right and then all of a sudden it's like part of my identity is like okay I'm not a col- I'm not a basketball player anymore like what am I doing so then I was like. I can be a college basketball player if I like put the work in. I right. Was just like, like truly Laser blind. Focus. Yeah. And I was just like, I want to do this thing. And like, obviously, like, not everyone, like, it, the things have to be in line. Like, there needs to be a spot on the team. Like, mm-hmm. they need to take walk ons, uh, all this stuff. But like, for whatever reason, like, a they need like a big guy. And like, I was like kind of tall. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm not a division one basketball player, but they like kind of like needed someone like me. Yeah. So I tried out and they were like, yeah, <laughs> dude, that's awesome. So, so like, they, did they just have like open tryouts? Yeah. Open tryouts. Yeah. And how many people showed up? They're like 20. Damn. Maybe. But I tried out my sophomore year and I didn't make it. And they were like, if we would have taken anyone, it would have been you. So oh, I was like, good hope. Oh, I'll see you next year. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like that year. I was just like, I would like just to go to the, the rec center at Fordham, just like play all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. That's badass to to take that leap and just go for it though, and then like you get to play like, like I saw you like shaking hands with Bayheim and like, <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah. By the way, like your captions are fucking funny. Like you're <laughs> you're witty. Like I was actually nervous about the podcast because I'm like I hope some of his hu- humor doesn't go over my head. I'm like I'm usually good at catching most things, <laughs> but I'm like he's witty and he might just like throw some stuff out there that I just whiff on because I'm thinking about the next thing we're gonna talk about. <laughs> I'm like I hope he doesn't make me look like a jackass over here. I no like it's. I don't know because like we're all it's the same thing with like instagram and social media we're all just like figuring it out like i don't yeah. know like i feel like sometimes it could just be like you're just like doing 
too much. Like you're going a little too far on the yeah. on the captions, but uh, no, it's funny. You got some good ones up there. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Jim, ba- yeah, yeah, like all of a sudden I was just like shaking hands with Jim Beheim and like warming up in in or playing in Madison Square Garden, um, playing yeah, at Barclays yeah. Center or warming up in the Barclays Center. I shot some air balls in the Barclays Center. <laughs> up. It was nice. <laughs> Uh, that's cool though man and then you got some buckets against my alma mater yeah 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 we got to talk about philly because i didn't i didn't realize that you went to st joe's i guess uh, so you graduated valley view in 20 uh, 19 or two, uh, 2009 yeah and then st joe's in 13 um, did you like what was your as a like st joe's student or as just like a f- student of a philly school what was your relationship to the city of Philadelphia? Like, did you get to explore it much or were you just kind of mostly at St. Joe's? Um, on, like we did our fair share of exploring for sure. Um, but honestly, like I, I remember like truly like taking that cab ride in was like a financial thing for me where I'm like, I yeah. could just stay here and have a good time. Yeah. I'm like, I don't need to spend like the 15 bucks to go into the city. And, uh, and like, I guess I could have taken trains and shit like that more often. Um, I wish I went in more, mm-hmm. um, but like, like you just get comfortable and I'm just like, dude, I, like I used to stress them. Like I had like no money. It's like whatever yeah. money I made in the summer, working whatever job was like the money, spending money I had for the year. And that wasn't the case for all my friends. Um, yeah. So I was just That's like always spot. like just trying to like keep up and like scrape by. Um, but yeah, like that extra like 10 or 15 bucks at the time, it's, it's like crazy to think about now, but like it mattered. So I was just like, nah, we'll just go to a party here or just do yeah. this or that. But like I definitely ventured down quite a bit and I had a lot of buddies at Temple and stuff. So I went to Temple a lot, like taking the train over. Um, but yeah, like I wish I I did get to experience the city more. And like, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that you miss on because you don't have the funds as well. Not mm-hmm. even just getting there, but like getting to you know, eat at some of the, the better restaurants, like the niceties that the city has to offer. Yeah. You don't always get to, um, experience, but, um, no, I, I enjoyed St. Joe's. It was, uh, looking back, like probably not the best fit for me and my personality at the time, but you make the most of it. And it's just yeah. like, you don't know anything different. So it is what it is. Yeah. Did, where did you did you always live like within the or did you ever live at like so like f- freshman and sophomore year we had to live up um closer to campus and then junior and senior year was in maniunk which oh, nice. is the best like maniunk yeah. was great yeah um i was just biking through maniunk yesterday and i sent because uh, i have friends uh i had a friend my two like best well my cousin bob went to st joe's he was a year behind you and then my friend luke walker went to temple and they lived together with, oh really uh, Mike, do you know Mike Jordan from Carbondale? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they all live together in, in Maniac. I, I biked by their house. Yeah, just like so many great memories of just like yeah. visiting them and staying in Maniac. I, I didn't realize that it was, it's just like so many either in college or like just out of college, just like all yeah. right there and you're just like having a good time. Yeah, that's all it is. It's yeah. crazy. Like to see somebody over the age of like 32 there is just yeah. like unheard of. Yeah, yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. Like you go downtown or, or to Main Street, not downtown, but yeah. And it's, yeah, it's all, it was always a good time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed Maniunk for sure. I thought about living there. Like, I'm like, maybe I'll get a job, work here for a little bit. And then like to our point earlier, a couple of my buddies did move home immediately. And, uh, I'm like, uh, and I ended up getting a job with Lockheed Martin right out of school. So I'm like, it's a, literally a mile from my parents' house. I'm like, this is too good to pass up. Like jobs like this at home are yeah. harder to come by. I'm like, if it's knocking, I got to kind of take it now. A little bit of regret there. I'm like, maybe I should have lived a little more, but yeah. Did make uh, up for it now. How long were you at Lockheed Martin? Not long. Uh, like a year and a half. Was it, was it locals only that you went in full time with to leave that or? No. That? Um, so I had taken a different job. Um, and I was probably working there for like three or four years before I started locals only project. So like, I still have a full time job. Oh, you do? Yeah. Dang, dude. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, I just, so I was in finance for like 10 years and I like three months ago, just switched to a marketing role, which Whoa. is more in line with this yeah. and probably where I belong. Um, That's crazy. You're doing a lot of stuff. Staying busy. <laughs> Dang. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I've been at the same place, that, um, since I left Lockheed Martin though, Santa Fe. Um, so yeah, staying busy, but, um, yeah, I, I, I liked Philly. Um, it's, 
some of my interests though it's just like like i enjoy hunting i enjoy doing some other things back home so i just kind of gravitate it back here eventually i wanted to ask you about hunting also because when you and jake were talking about hunting it it occurred to me that like we grew up within 15 minutes of each other Mm -hmm. but like and i knew people growing up in like grade school at olp and uh at prep in high school who like loved hunting and would do it all the time and i was like friends with them but Mm -hmm. i just like it just like never yeah interested me right because like i feel like in grade school like growing up it's either you're in it or you're not yeah and like there's no exposure to it unless somebody takes you or like you ask to go or like you're a family thing like yeah because like sports like everybody gets exposed to and that's like the common thread for everybody for the most part Mm -hmm. and then yeah hunting it's either like all in or all out type of deal Mm -hmm. and then like yeah it is weird like after that like people kind of slowly like what is this and like maybe they'll like pick up a handgun like maybe just to have at the house or this or that and then it's like yeah maybe i'll try hunting and like then like social media helps and like you see um you know some of the walls get broken down in terms of like you think you're like some redneck drinking beer in the woods and um that's like an unfortunate picture that a lot of people have in their head for a long time and then it's like that's the you know there's some good people out there on social media now like advocating like why hunting makes sense and yeah the population control aspect of it and like the respect for for the for the animals that um a lot of hunters do have there's still a ton of shitheads out there poachers (laughs) and stuff like that but um yeah it's it's a it's a kind of all in or all out type of deal when you guys were talking about i was like I was like, this is cool. Like when you were talking about like the, the coyotes and the population, uh, uh, control, it's like, yeah, like this makes sense. This is, this is needed and necessary. And like, for me, like, like we were saying, like we love like the nature stuff and like mm-hmm. so much of hunting is just like chilling outdoors and just yeah. like waiting for something to come by. It seems, it seems like right up my alley, but I've never like, yeah, I don't know. And that's, that is like one of the, so I will say I got into archery hunting, like fairly late for me like i've been hunting forever but um archery has changed it even more so because because it's not like how we were saying earlier like out west it's more like spot and stock and and it more of an active hunt compared to mm-hmm. um a little bit more passive here in pennsylvania um bow hunting is like it's so intimate because like to get something within bow range like you for most people like you want it within 40 yards so like you're getting really close to animals that like it's really hard to get them that close because when they're in the woods, it's not like in the neighborhoods, like they're used to people and like you could see them and they don't get spooked. Like in the woods, they could be 200 yards away and they catch a little slight wind of you. Like if you just had a sandwich or just like your body odor, like, and they're just gone. And like, sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it's subtle. Like they could be walking right toward you. Like, all right, this is it. Like, just be patient. Stay calm. And like, then they just, they just stop and dead in their tracks. You didn't do a damn thing. You just see the nose going. And then just they'll just like huff one time and then just completely change path. And it's like, what the hell did I do? (laughs) And it's just like, so like that game of it is fun. Um, But in in terms, so the reason why I said bow hunting, like you're getting a lot closer to the animals and they're a lot more active then. So you see a a lot more of the deer behavior, particularly like um, because you, you basically like wait for the rut, which is like when they're, um, the does go into heat and, and the deer are really chasing cause they only breed like two weeks out of the year basically. Um, so seeing that is, is really neat and you, you get the, the it's, they're the most active then. Um, so you get to see like a lot of just like neat stuff and like depending on where you're hunting too, like when you're hunting deer, like you might see a flock of 30 turkeys come by. And then like, if you're lucky, you might see a bobcat or a, coyote or a bear that like there's so many different things um that you could see and and appreciate and you're you have no intent on killing any of those things either because they're not in season or whatever mm-hmm. you're just there for the deer but like as a byproduct of just putting yourself in those situations you get to to see a lot of cool stuff that's cool it's um it is like like hiking like it's just putting yourself in those situations and even like to photography it's like I was thinking about this yesterday. Like, it doesn't matter what gets you there. Like for me, like when I first got my cameras, I'm like, I just paid like all this friggin' money for this camera. Like I'm gonna use it. Yeah. And like I was taking trips 
intentionally like for the photography component of it and i liked hiking um and i'm like you like maybe that's shallow at the time like the more i think about it i'm like i'm just like trying to go get like cool pictures for instagram like yeah. stupid yeah. um but i'm like it doesn't matter it got me there and like yeah. i got to see cool shit because of it yeah it's just like charity it's like even like you could eye roll people when like they want to throw their name on the the big check that they just donated fifty thousand dollars <laughs> to this cause and like you're just doing it for like good PR or a tax write off, whatever. But it's like at the end of the day, charity's still getting the money. So like, yeah. yeah, is it a little gross that you have to do it that way? Yeah. But like, at least you're still doing a good thing. Like, yeah. so it's like, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there. And yeah, hunting and photography is, and the hiking is just like one of those things, like just setting yourself up for like cool experiences like that is, is neat. What was it for you that got what that chose like photography? Like why photography? Dude, I don't even know. Um, part of it was a need from the business because I was like just bootstrapping like the whole thing and like I can't pay a photographer for these shoots yeah. and like every time I have a new product, like I can't pay somebody like two hundred bucks to come picture it. Um, so I'm like I'll just pay the money up front and then pay myself back, you know, basically. Um, if I just am able to learn and YouTube everything and uh so like part of it was a business need and then part of it was, yeah, then it just kind of was like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. I like playing in Lightroom and seeing what you can yeah. do with pictures and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, it just like snowballed like everything else. Just start hiking more, start picturing, yeah. you know, experiences and stuff like that. So, yeah. What about you? Like what got you into the photography? Was it peach baskets or was it, um, did you have an interest before that? It was, I don't, I feel like it was I had a Google Pixel phone mm -hmm. in 2017, 2018, because I did this like remote work, uh, international remote work trip. And, and so I was doing a different international city every month for a year. And I, and I just had this new phone that took really good pictures. And I just kind of like started taking pictures from it that I, I don't know, I felt I, and then sharing it on Instagram. And I, similar like relationship with Instagram, it's like, am I, I'm just like doing this to like just like look cool right and and like a part of it probably was i just like hey look i'm in croatia how cool am i yeah but and uh, i have a better camera than you <laughs> yeah yeah and like that's what but I, I fell in love with photography through that i think of just like telling i don't know i'm a sucker for just like storytelling and mm -hmm. i realized that as i get older just like we're all just like telling stories yeah uh, and that's how we like evolved to where we are now as humans just like we were able to tell stories better than other species or animals yeah, that's um, how we're able to survive yeah yeah and so that's how I, I was like all right i need to document this like cool part of my life and like share it and then i was like oh this is the photography thing is cool like maybe i'll just like get a when i get home i'll get a camera and i that's what i did i gotta use camera and yeah. started watching youtube yeah it's weird how everybody kind of comes to that point and like you said like social media was all new like we were all like whether it was captions or the pictures themselves it's like we're all kind of learning together yeah and, yeah it, people were taking selfies and that's embarrassing now. Or like yeah. we were <laughs> writing certain captions that are like, everything's cringeworthy like 10 years later, yeah. like for the most part, like there's only a handful of things like you could really look back on and be proud of. Like at some point, like you do get caught up in the trend and it is the norm. And at the time it's not as bad. And then like 10 years later, it's like, God, remember Instagram filters, like yeah. those like <laughs> yeah. stock filters. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the I don't know, some of the names were just popping through my head but like sepia or whatever yeah, or yeah like, all that and like you can shit. like make the borders like you can mess with all the borders there's some of like my early instagram pictures that are just like edited so much like mm -hmm. to like just beat it to the ground i would like put the vignette in yeah, and, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's just like it's you like, just max out everything that is at your disposal yeah, it's like yeah. oh brightness all the way up all contrast the way. all the way yeah. up sharpness all the way up <laughs> clear uh everything vignette. share yep share. everyone's got to see this four likes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh the best. yeah good times learning that stuff i do miss the uh sometimes like and i feel like it's kind of happening a little bit now where like people are just sharing like dumb shit again <laughs> yeah i'm like Dude, like, just share your stupid cheeseburger on a plate at your 4th of July cookout. Like, it's awesome. <laughs> like, whatever. Why not? Yeah. Who cares? We don't need the epic photos all the time. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, this is, I, I had a really good time. I appreciate you coming up. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. I feel like we got quite a bit more to talk about. Yeah. Um, I would love to. That, 
time flies, man. I know. I feel like people always say that on a podcast, but it really does. It really does. And like, I've like with every guest so far, I'm like at the end, I'm like, I could easily go for another hour. That, you got some, that's, that's when you know you got some good. Like yeah. you, you're good. Everybody, everybody's been awesome so far. I'm, and like, even like you have some hesitancy here and there. It's like, well, like, what are we going to talk about for two hours? Mm-hmm. And like, it just goes, man. Yeah. And, but whatever. Hopefully people listen. If not, eventually <laughs> they'll get through. Heck but yeah. uh yeah thanks again for coming up it was nice meeting you and learning a bit more about your story and uh yeah we'll definitely we'll definitely run it back next time you're in um maybe six months from now or something we'll get some more stories cooking and we'll do it again heck yeah part All two right. baby cool man appreciate it yep